Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, session uh, with me, Isaac. Right, it's uh, good to be back, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, you know, just join me um, for this uh, introduction to fundamental analysis. Now, I, I apologize if, if if you guys are not able to see me clearly, but uh, it's not my face that you guys should really be looking at. It should be the slides, right? So. I'm pretty sure you guys didn't join for my face, but rather for the slides. All right, so um, yeah, today we're gonna cover really the basic uh, fundamentals of um, fundamental analysis. Now, before I dive right into the topic, I just want to uh, be sure that you guys can hear me loud and clear. More importantly, you guys can also see the slide, right? So you should see introduction to FA with Isaac Lim, Okay, if you guys can just drop a quick comment in the question uh, in the question pane below. All right, fantastic. Thanks a lot, Tristan. Okay, so with that, I assume that uh, none of you um, really have an issue. So let's begin. Now, if 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 any time throughout uh, this uh, webinar, you guys actually have questions for me, right? Feel free to just stop me in the middle of my presentation, and um, I will do my best to answer your questions. Okay, so now before I begin, this is just a very quick disclaimer uh, that uh, we just have to let you guys know that the information contained in this material is intended for general advice only. All right, uh, it does not take into account your financial, uh, your investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs. So FP Markets uh, does not, um, uh, it should not be held liable for any of the any of the uh, recommendations and advice provided in this uh, presentation. Now, this presentation really is for informational purposes only, right? However, having said that, uh, I as the presenter have done my due diligence to make sure that everything that has been prepared at this uh, during this presentation is accurate and correct at the time of presentation. All right, so with that, let's quickly begin, All right? So, I have four simple points to cover today uh, about regarding uh, introduction to fundamental analysis. Now, uh, I just want to know, okay, for all the attendees that are in the webinar right now, right, I, I just want to have a feel of how, how experienced you guys are when it comes to um, trading, uh, investing, fundamental analysis, right? Just um, pop the comment into the question pane once more. And just let me know, beginner, or even uh, if you want to say 10 years, all right, that, that, that kind of thing. I just want to get a few so I can sort of tailor it um, accordingly. Okay, so we have um, we have wide range of, um, thanks a lot for your replies, right? I love to keep this uh, interactive, right? So um, it's, it's a nice flow, right, back and forth. Okay, so we have, uh, really um, a huge range. Wow. Um, beginners to even six years. Wow. Okay. So um, for those of you uh, who really, really experienced, all right, um, please pardon me if it's a bit too simplistic for you. Uh, and for those of you who are really just starting out, right, uh, this webinar series is really uh, tailored more for you. So uh, I hope you guys actually do take away some value. And what I'm sharing with you guys today really will value it to your trading journey. Okay, so what is fundamental analysis? Okay, um, in short, it is really a method of analysis that tries to determine the intrinsic value of an underlying security. All right, uh, this security here, this asset class here that I'm referring to could very well mean um, the equities, individual stocks. All right, it could very well uh, be referring to fixed income. All right, um, why I'm leaving out um, FX, why I'm leaving out uh, 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 commodities is because uh, those have um, uh, external factors that cannot be uh, put into a data and collated and statistical studies being done on it. Right, so it's a bit tough to do fundamental. It's a, it's a lot tougher, not a bit tough, but it's a lot tougher to do fundamental analysis on on, on asset classes like FX and uh, even commodities, all right? But just because it's tougher, it does not mean it's impossible. All right, so how did fundamental analysis really started out, all right? Uh, 
fundamental analysis compared to technical analysis. Okay, fundamental analysis is uh, sort of like a baby, right? So TA has been around for a very, very long time. Okay, um, it might come as a surprise to some of you guys, right? TA has been around for a very long time. FA has really only been around since the um, earlier part of the, the, the 1900s when um, the US capital markets started opening up, right? So it really was, uh, FA was really developed by um, what is white, who, uh, by the person who is widely recognized as the father of fundamental analysis, that is Benjamin Graham, Ben Graham for, 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 for short. Okay, uh, he really first wrote this book called Security Analysis, right? It talks about um, how to analyze, how to uh, value individual securities in the stock markets. Okay, so, um, and fundamental analysis was further popularized, right? So it was developed by Benjamin Graham, okay? Uh, but it was really further popularized by uh, the very famous, um, uh, Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, right, um, who really came out with this style of value investing, right? So Warren Buffett sort of um, uh, made this fundamental analysis style, value investing style of uh, investing, of trading um, to become really, really popular. All right, so so this is really the, the, the rough background, okay, of uh, fundamental analysis. All right, you guys are following me so far. It's a very simple, short and sweet sort of uh, introduction to fundamental analysis. Okay. So there you have it. Um, if you guys are interested in reading up more about fundamental analysis, that is uh, the sixth edition um, of the book that uh, is around. It's, it's, it's actually one, um, one of those uh, more famous books, right? Security Analysis by Benjamin Graham and David Dawn. All right, so uh, John, you're asking how long does this go for? I think you're referring to the webinar, all right? Uh, the webinar roughly should be about an hour long, okay? So uh, if, you, if you're busy and you want to come back uh, later, all right, uh, halfway through, that's fine as well. All right, so Another book that you guys would like to read if you guys are interested in picking up value investing and, and how to do proper security analysis will be this other book called um, Intelligent Investor, also by Benjamin Graham. Right, so uh, these two books, I have read them, okay? Uh, it's just not my style, all right? Uh, but having said that, you do pick up nuances in the market that, uh, that, 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 that this book actually teaches you. Right, so it's really still helpful in understanding how a stock should be looked at. Okay, so what are some of the principles behind fundamental analysis? Okay, I, I have somebody who is raising the hands here. All right, there, there's really no need to, to raise your hands. If, if you guys got a question, just feel free to fire away. All right. So I yeah, what are the principles behind fun, uh, fundamental analysis? Now, um, for those of you who have gone through business school, who have studied uh, economics, right, you'll know that fundamental analysis, okay, holds the assumption that markets are both efficient and rational, okay, and based on the efficient market hypothesis, there are many different forms of efficient market hypothesis, right, there is the weak form, there is the uh, semi-strong, and then there's the strong form uh, market hypothesis. Okay, so the idea behind EMH, efficient market hypothesis, is really the fact that um, in the strong form market hypothesis, what, what, what the academics are trying to say is that at no point in time should uh, market participants be able to make a sizable amount of profits, okay, based on um, all the known, uh, what do you call it, all the known information that is out there in the market. So all the public information that is out there in the market, no one should be able to make a sizable amount of profit from the markets. Okay, so really it's down to that point where there really is no point investing or uh, or trading at all, right? There's really no point in trading. You just have to invest, hold for the long term, and hopefully you pick a very um, valuable stock that rises in value over time. Okay, so it's that intrinsic value that fundamental analysts try to look out for. 
All right, so random walk theory is also another um, academic theory that really is developed by uh, this gentleman called Robert uh, Malkiel. All right, so what he um, is popularized by this book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. I'm not sure if any of you have read it, but it's also um, very interesting to, um, to, to, to read this book because essentially the, 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 the very summarized, the very condensed Way of looking at a book is that a monkey throwing darts okay um to pick stocks can probably do better than a human okay using all sort of publicly uh, available information to uh can prop the monkey can probably do better in terms of investing generating a higher return than the human who does a proper study for uh based on all publicly available information right so he's saying that um Profits in the markets are really random. Profits in the markets, just like the EMH, just like the efficient market hypothesis, um, profits cannot be easily uh, gained, right? So that is um, that is how academics uh, see fundamental analysis. So if you guys have gone through economics school, uh, business school, you guys will really learn that you know um, uh, uh, Satterist parables, right? Assuming all things equal. Okay, you guys will not be able to make a profitable living from the markets. Okay, so, uh, but there's a lot of assumptions, right? Um, increasingly over the years, there's this new branch of uh, economics that's been coming out. Uh, it's called behavioral economics. Now we know that the markets are not fully rational, right? People do things in a very irrational way. Markets are not fully efficient. Okay, prices do not just... Uh, jump from one level to another level sort of something like that prices do not jump from one price level okay all right to another price level with time right they do not it's not a step graph all right but rather prices okay with time sort of drift higher okay and it finally reaches its intrinsic value and it is really in this area all right it is really in this area where traders can make money profitably make money from the markets so um in recent development right we were seeing uh, more uh, economic nobel uh nobel prize for the economics being given to um, people like uh, Robert Schiller, all right, uh, I, I can't really remember the name offhand, but they are starting this branch called behavioral economics, where instead of saying that there's the efficient market hypothesis, now the efficient market hypothesis is being changed to something called the adaptive. Okay, adaptive market hypothesis, which means that um, when there is a new publicly uh when there's a new piece of information that's made publicly available all right the markets do not prices do not immediately jump to the intrinsic value right prices take time to adjust towards the intrinsic value because the market is actually a collection of um humans right is a is a collection of beings and 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 beings they have emotions such as greed and fear and it's these emotions that really causes market prices to fluctuate all right, so um, I've got a few questions here. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Will there be a replay? Yes, uh, um, there will be a replay. Okay, um, you can actually email the 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 this uh this email to FP Markets. Okay, support at fpmarkets.com. Right, so I I'm pretty sure they will make a replay available for you. Okay, so John, you're asking um even with day trading, I think you're referring to efficient market hypothesis yeah so basically academics believe that there's no way that people can make money from trading right everything is really just pure luck right whether you are profitable you're not profitable it is pure dumb luck according to the the academics that we have today right but we know those people who those of you who have been trading for some time now even with one year of trading experience you'll know that it is profitable to make money from the markets right um uh, uh with 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 discipline with proper trade management you can actually make money from the markets okay so another principle behind uh fundamental analysis is 
to find this thing called the intrinsic value, right? It is, it's to find this thing called the intrinsic value, okay? So intrinsic value, okay, uh, okay, so Tristan, you're asking, the right graph is adaptive, the left one is called, okay, so the left one is just basically called a step graph, all right? This follows uh, the efficient market hypothesis, Sorry, please pardon my handwriting because I'm writing with the mouse. All right, where let's say, okay, um, price is currently over here. All right, price is at this at this point. All right, price is at this point, and then suddenly there is a public, there's a news, a very important piece of news, sort of uh, say maybe um, this company ABC is going to get a huge fund injection from one of the biggest asset managers in the world because um, they see a lot of potential in it, right? So um, this is the current price and then based on the news announcement, suddenly prices just jump straight up and it reaches its intrinsic value, okay? So this is a step graph. So academics are telling you that right now, this is the model. There is no way you can make money from the market. However, in real life, you just open up any charts, okay? You will see that prices are moving and then after a news there's a, a lot of volatility and news gradually drifts towards its intrinsic value and it is over here where you can actually buy on dips okay you can buy at this point you can even buy on this pullback and sort of ride the wave up and gain those profits all right so uh tristan i hope that answers your question okay so one of the main um, principle, back to the slides, one of the main principle behind fundamental analysis is the fact that um, fundamental analysts are looking for this thing called intrinsic value, right? It's sort of that, uh, that, that, that hidden pearl in the field, right? It is sort of that, uh, that, 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 that holy um, grill returns, right? Um, and, and, and this is the intrinsic value that made Warren Buffett so uh, famous with his place in uh, Coca-Cola, right? Um, uh, but what uh, I'm not sure if you guys know, what people do not really know is um, a lot of Warren Buffett's um, wealth was also generated from his insurance business, right? Not so much his um, investing, but also mainly from his insurance business. Okay, so it's not just one line of business that he managed to get his intrinsic value from. It's really also based on insurance. So it is, it is interesting, right? Because the idea of insurance, the entire concept of insurance, just to digress a bit, is really to, to bank on the fact that, you know, nothing is certain in this world, right? Um, uh, and, 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 that, and that markets are adaptive, right? Things happen, things react quite quickly, all right? Uh, but there's still time, okay? To, 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 to take advantage of that reaction rather than things happen immediately and then you miss that move, okay? So how is intrinsic value determined, right? Um, fundamental analyst actually op, uh, obtains intrinsic value by using a wide variety of data inputs, okay? Such as financial statements, economic data, news like government intervention, like Joe Biden's uh, uh, recent... Uh, uh, injection of funds into the into the money markets, okay, 1.9 trillion, all right, and then even first-hand ob observations, right? So there are there are uh, asset managers out there, there are funds out there that actually send their analysts to, <clears throat> sorry, to actually interview, right, the the management of the of the company to actually walk the grounds of the of the company that they are going to invest in to to see how the business is being run right so intrinsic value there are many ways of determining intrinsic value so this brings me back to the first point which i was sharing in the previous slide would be this is one of the reasons why fa um, doesn't work so well with the forex or the commodity markets right because um, for fundamental analysts, how are you going to go into a forex market and say that, hey, you know, the intrinsic value of Aussie dollar is going to be at this price, right? How are you going to say that the intrinsic value of, um, of, 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 of let's say, uh, gold prices is going to be at this price, right? What, what affects gold, right? There, there, is, no, there is no real uh, company that controls gold, right, uh, or produce gold. Gold is a naturally occurring um, metal in in, in the world in limited quantity, right? So it's very hard to value um, commodities. It's very hard to value 
um, FX, okay? Even things like oil, okay? Um, oil prices are rising and then suddenly it drops overnight. Why? Because people are just generally fearful of the OPEC meeting that is due to happen later on Thursday, right? Um, they do not know that if production is going to be cut or production uh, is, is, uh, is, is going to be increased, right? So, so these are things that fundamental analysts cannot analyze, right? Um, uh, because there is a lack of proper data, right? Um, there's a lack of uh, proper statistical study on that, right? And by the time the data is released, if the fundamental analyst wants to make use of this data to, to do their statistical study, to come out with their models, right? I'm sorry, price has moved. Okay, so it's, thank you. So it's a bit tougher for, um, for fundamental analysts to actually really uh, value things in the markets such as FX or commodities. All right, so I, I hope you guys are, are clear on this, okay? Um, but having said that, there are, some, uh, there are some factors that the fundamental analysts can look at, okay? So I will go through that with you in a bit. All right, but you guys are clear so far. A any questions regarding the principle behind fundamental analysis? Okay, fantastic. All right, thanks for the reply, Shane. All right, so let me just erase the drawing so it doesn't get in the way. Okay, so these are just some, um, some of the factors that a fundamental analyst would actually look at. Okay, um, they will look at uh, the economic, the general economy as a whole, right? Um, and then they'll look at the industry, all right, or the sector as a whole. And then they'll look at the individual company itself. So um, just... Some of the factors that they look at, you see um, under economic analysis, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so there are 14 factors to look at under sectoral. These are general guidelines, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All right, 15 factors to look at. And then after you're done with the 14 and the 15, the 29 factors, you go look at the individual companies. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven. So the fundamental analyst job is not something that is easy, right? It's really tough. Okay, that's why um, a lot of uh, fundamental analysts are really just um, uh, uh, they're sort of uh, what we call lifers in their in their sectors. So the moment you start out as a as a fundamental analyst, a junior analyst for let's say the pharma the big pharma um, sector, right? So you're looking at um, uh, Merck and Illidan, okay? You're looking at uh, 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 Johnson & Johnson, all right? This junior analyst is going to probably stay in the pharma industry throughout the entire course of his career as a fundamental analyst. All right, so these are just some of the general principles behind fundamental analysis. Okay, so I, I have a question from one of the attendees over here. So how important is the EPS to a company? So EPS, for those of you who aren't clear, is really called the earnings per share, right? So the earnings per share, okay, um, okay, the earnings per share ratio, what it, what it really means is really a, a portion of the company's profit. Right, a portion of the company's profit divided by the outstanding shares that's traded on the market. Right, so what what it tells you is that theoretically speaking, it is the indicator of the company's profitability. Okay, so um, the general idea is that the higher the EPS ratio, the more profitable it is considered to be. All right, um, but at the same time, I would really advise that um. Uh, sense of caution be be taken, okay? Um, why? Because my brother, right, is in the audit and taxation uh, industry. So he he does all this for 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 big firms, right? And you are talking about NMCs, right? Big 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 firms, okay? And before <clears throat> before the earnings per share, the final financial statement is actually released, right? The 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 balance sheet, okay, um, all that, all that value, all that figures, all right, is really um, audited and adjusted, audited and adjusted and audited and adjusted multiple times until it is, you know, um, 
fit, okay, um, and it goes through this thing called a qualified opinion, right? And the moment it's given a qualified opinion, only then is it put together and announced during an earnings call, which is where we get the earnings per share. Then you can go and calculate once there's the company earnings, you can go and divide it by all the outstanding shares in the market, right? So from the time that really the, the, the company's financial department, the finance department is calculating all these values to the time that the qualified opinion is actually given, there is a lead and a lag time, right? <clears throat> and you really don't know how many times this figure has been adjusted. It's tough to find out um, how accurate really this EPS is. So just by depending on EPS alone, okay, um, uh, yeah, you're talking about uh, uh, there's a lag time, there's a sizable amount of a lag time, okay, it, it may not be very accurate, all right, so how important it is to a company, okay, um, I think generally speaking for the broad economy, the higher the EPS is, it's, it, it seems like the, the company is doing better, right, um, however, on the flip side, okay, you want to be careful of a company that has um, too high um, an EPS, all right, um, it, it will really mean that, um, Okay, it will really mean that there is uh they are they're not maximizing okay their their shareholders equity as well, right? Because uh there are two little shares going out there. Okay. All right, so uh Sahid, you're saying uh, companies or organization become pertinent in lieu of considerations of their financial statements or other financial records become relevant for FA of the market. Yeah, so Many so 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 just by looking at an individual company's EPS alone is not going to tell you much. That is where the sectoral um, analysis of the broader uh, market comes in, where um, you need to actually take the EPS of that company and compare it to similar companies around and see whether is it higher than average or lower than average. And ge the general idea is if it is higher than average, then it should be an outperforming company, right? So. Thanks for thanks for the sharing. I appreciate it. Okay, do you guys have any other questions regarding um, uh, all these financial ratios? <clears throat> okay, if uh, no questions, then I, I'll just move on. Okay, so there are primarily two types of um, of fundamental analysis, right? Uh, as as I shared earlier, okay. Let me just erase this drawing. All right. So the first type of analysis, uh, of FA analysis, is really this thing called macro analysis, right? So macro, you are looking at the big picture, right? Broad picture kind of thing. You are looking at uh economic factors, right? Uh, fiscal policy. Uh, uh, let's say you are. You are, you are going to um, analyze the fundamentals of a company such as Apple, okay? There are global economic factors. You need to start looking at um, Apple's um, product share of um, not just within uh, their headquarters in US, but also in China, in places like India, right? In places like Singapore, where, where, where I'm from, right? Um, and, and you need to start looking at um, all these factors, okay? And whether there are strong competitors of Apple in this market, uh, in this global markets, right? You need to look at fiscal policy. Uh, um, the, the fiscal policy of um, the governments that Apple is operating in, those various countries, right? So you need to look at the Singapore government, whether they are supporting the tax structure of uh, Apple, whether they're giving uh, tax incentives, right? And then you have to look at monetary policy because the earnings, right? The earnings that um, Apple, for example, earns in China, right? And, and earns in uh, Singapore, all right? That, at the end of the day, it's going to have to be converted back into USD, right? So, so how does the exchange rate, okay, um, uh, actually affects Apple's earning, okay? So, so these are the things that you really want to look at, all right? Um, uh, over here, we have this factor called monsoon and agriculture, right? This one is more for uh, analyzing commodities, okay? So let's say you are analyzing the cattle, uh, sugar or the cotton uh, industry, or even the rice, rice industry, okay? Um, if you guys didn't know, right? Uh, I was just talking to some of my colleagues this morning. Orange juice is actually traded on the US uh, markets. Um, and recently also I've come across um, water ETFs, 
Okay, so this is these are just some very interesting things that you guys might want to check out as well. So how does monsoon season? Um, how does um the harvest season? Okay, affect uh how does the weather right uh affect uh all these producers? Okay, of the soft commodities as we call it. All right. <clears throat> And then if you're looking, an example is if you are if you if you are based in Australia and you want to um buy into the big um Australian mining companies, right? Uh what are some of the mining companies? Uh let me think, I cannot remember. Okay, uh, I think they have uh BHP Billiton. All right, or, 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 or Newcrest Mining, Rio Tinto, these are some of the biggest uh, mining companies, right? And at the end of the day, right, you you want to calculate, um, you know, how, how they're doing as a company, right? Whether they are, they are not so much about just their free cash flow that you're looking at from balance sheet. You want to look at the projects in the pipeline, right? Whether they have future cash flows, okay? Then you're going to have to look at the trade, right? Australia and China very close trading partners okay and 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 i think australia is also um sending copper a lot of copper out to taiwan as well right because taiwan is like the semiconductor capital of the world right so you need to start looking at all these different factors right how much copper is australia actually shipping out exporting to all these external countries right and and then and then based on that you want to check um uh, it's real Tinto, Newcrest Mining, BHP Filiton, right? How are they comparing with one another? What are the sort of projects in the pipeline that they have in the future? Okay, what are the sort of uh, management um, styles that the, the, the management committee has? So it's, it's really a lot of factors to consider, right? So macro analysis, all right? Once you're done with the macro analysis, the next type of fundamental analysis is really micro analysis. So this is where... Um, like I, I've shared earlier, we look at the ROA, the return on assets, the share price itself. All right, we look at the valuation. Is it valued fairly or is it undervalued, overvalued? All right, you look at the cash flow. You don't just look at free cash flow, you look at future cash flow, right? And then, of course, there's the PE ratio. And as um, earlier, one of our friends in the, in the, in the room also asked, the EPS, all right? So <clears throat> you don't want a company that has um, too much free cash flow, right? Too much free cash flow are they giving out in terms of dividend what's the dividend uh, structure like all right um is this is are they reinvesting this free cash flow that they have all right how's the future um cash flow looking like for the company so a lot of factors to consider especially when it comes to doing fundamental analysis a lot of hard work all right um very very tedious okay so um but at the end of the day, it is also still a good skill to have because when you can combine um, fundamental analysis and technical analysis, right? Uh, you can actually start finding out whether firstly this company is undervalued, overvalued fundamentally, and then you can find the best time to enter uh, by using technical analysis. And then when you find the uh, interest, when you can project the intrinsic value, you can see whether it ties in line with uh, 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 support or resistance right on the chart. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so when we combine um, both types, both macro and micro analysis, right? At the end of the day, it's really something like that. We get this top down approach style of uh, fundamental analysis where you look at a broad-based market uh, economy the macro economy all right and um, uh, it, it, there is this style of uh, investing that is really called the global macro view all right there are hedge funds out there that employs a global macro strategy uh, very complex not the easiest uh, you got to be a really a bright mind before you can do something like that so once they're done with the macroeconomic analysis, all right, they go down to the industry, the sectoral analysis. Now, um, it's really a bit tougher for individuals to do something like that. But if you have access to, let's say, a, a paid program, all right, or even Bloomberg, right, you can do this thing called the RRG, right, the relative rotation graph. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the relative rotation graph actually shows how um, companies, 
within a sector, or you can even look at sectors within a broad index, okay, how they rotate from lagging to leading, okay, lagging to growth to leading, and then after that to slowing down and then back to lagging again. So it's really a cyclical thing. So it follows the business and the economic cycle. Okay, so Shane, you're asking me why I take oh why I also take company debt into account and who they owe money to. I uh, um yes, definitely. Okay, uh, but company debt, all right, um, <clears throat> not so much about who they owe money to, all right, but you should look at the amount of, um, uh, you should look at the amount of um, debt compared to the owner's equity, all right, um, because debt is seen as a liability, right? So assets plus liability, it should balance up to give you owner's equity, right? Um, okay, so, uh, just because a company has a huge amount of debt, that does not mean it's bad, okay? Um, you need to see uh, the cash flow of the company. If the cash flow is healthy, then uh, debt is all right. All right? Because in a capital structure, okay, debt is good. There are good debts, there are bad debts, right? Uh, if a company can actually issue debt, right, and, and, and actually pay back the debt over time, all right, then, then you need to also look at the rating of these uh, debt instruments, right? You can look at Fitch, you can look at uh, S&P, all right? Uh, these are just some of the way to also look at a company debt that, that is issued, all right? Uh, not so much who they owe money to. Okay, so Shane, I hope uh, this answers your question. <clears throat> All right, any other uh, questions relating to equities and uh, the analysis? Okay, I've got a question here. Um, Kevin, you're asking a pledged equity bet for a company. All right, uh, again, it really, uh, depends all right but understandably a pledge asset is really a collateral held by a lender in return for lending funds okay so your um, pledge assets can include cash stock bonds other equity or securities right so um, <clears throat> again from a very uh, academic and uh, neutral standpoint assuming everything is fine everything is okay right a, a pledge asset um should be fine right a pledge equity um to the lender should be okay um however if you take um if you take the financial crisis for example right so theoretically pledge equity is okay right like i said debts can be broken down into good debt bad debt right at the end of the day uh, a pledge equity could be a good debt as well, provided the borrower, the borrower, okay, is able to, to, to really uh, cough up this pledge equity, right? Um, two cases come to mind. Okay, the first case would be uh, the financial crisis, right? Uh, you have that uh, Lehman Brothers, right? So Le Lehman Brothers, um, there, there were, there were, uh, uh, there were bonds issued. Okay, there were um, stock certificates issued, all right, paper form, okay, from very, very long time ago, right? So all these are sort of um, a pledge collateral, right? Because um, uh, uh, the, the banks will probably need money from the, the, the depositors to sort of reinvest it and generate returns, right? <clears throat> In a very terrible market situation, such as the financial crisis, you know, um, based on personal experiences, right? You, you, you see that uh, when a big bank such as Lehman Brothers has closed down, right? There are a lot of investors that are stuck with a paper certificate, right? A pledge equity, okay? And there's nothing that they can lay claim to, right? Because the the company is the bank is down, right? The bank is shut down, all right? Nobody is going to buy it back from them, right? At the end of the day, um, this person that I know. Uh, actually framed up his paper certificate and he hung it at home, all right? Uh, and it shows uh, he's entitled to blah, blah, blah amount of uh, equities um, in Lehman Brothers, okay? So it just makes for a very nice display piece at home right now and very nice story, but that's about it, all right? So that's the first scenario. 
now the second scenario is um something that's uh, a bit closer to um the country where where I'm from, Singapore, right? <clears throat> Let me try to find the uh story, okay? <clears throat> Sorry, give me a Okay, so you guys can see this, right? Let me clear the story. All right, so uh, yeah, I'm not asking you guys to look at Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? But more of this, sorry, all this advert is so distracting, making me hungry. But basically, um, if you guys remember sometime in 2020, okay, um, oil, the oil market basically crashed. The futures actually gone into, uh, went into negative prices, okay? Now, one of the biggest oil trading firms in, in the world, Kin Leong, all right, um, old banks, are, are a couple of billions of dollars, I think it's 13 billion, right? And one of the one of the creditors was actually Sokgen, right, uh, the French bank, okay? So over here, this is an example, okay? Um, um, of course, they had ships, all right? Uh, Hin Leong, they own the physical asset, the pledge equity, all right? And these are the collateral, right? So now, right now, because they own, they owe the banks thirteen billion dollars. <clears throat> now they have to pay back one way or another, right? However, the broad economy is supposedly not doing very well because of COVID and all that. All right, and Hin Leong still has to pay back the debt, right? What do they have to do? They have to liquidate. All right, they have to sell their hard assets, right? Their ships, okay. And as of now, they are only able to sell one third, roughly 150 ships, okay, owned by them um, to pay back. Um, but there's also a trouble, right? Because when you sell such physical assets, there's an issue of liquidity, okay? There is a issue of um, valuation of this physical asset, okay? So the ships may not be worth as much after you depreciate them, you amortize them over a period of time that they've been used in service. The ships may not be worth as much as when it was uh, being built. Right, so at the end of the day, pledge equity can be bad, can be good. These two examples that I've given you are bad examples, all right, of why pledge equity is bad. Okay, so you guys really need to take the entire picture, all right. Uh, fun, that's fundamental analysis, right? You are you're taking the entire picture, macro, micro um, factors, putting it together to form a holistic understanding of really where the intrinsic value of the company should be. All right, so Kevin, uh, uh, a bit lengthy, I'm sorry, but uh, I hope this clarifies your question, okay? So I have about uh, 10 minutes, okay, about 10 minutes left. So I just really want to quickly dive into another part of the, the presentation, right? Um, a lot of it right now is about stocks. A lot of it is about equity, okay? Let's look at FX, right? Like I said earlier, right from the start, it is not impossible to do fundamental analysis on um, equities. Uh, sorry, on FX and commodities, all right, um, it's just a lot tougher. Now, uh, today is introduction to fundamental analysis, all right, uh, following um, later on, um, I think next week, okay, FP Markets will have a topic on um, understanding economic news, right? So I will clear, I will, I will clarify how to look at economic news um, over there. But for now, let's just scrape, uh, scrape the top of the, of the barrel, right? So, how do we carry out general fundamental analysis for things like um, forex, for things like uh, commodities? So it all starts with news, right? Again, remember it's the macro level, it's the big picture, right? So for FX, we can look at the economic calendar. For equities, we look at the earnings calendar, all right? Um, the key is to look for the high impact ones, okay? So some sources that you can use for the economic calendar, is an earnings calendar is really investing.com, TradingView, and Yahoo Finance. Okay, so let me just dive right straight to that. <clears throat> okay, so you can just go to Yahoo Finance and just search for and you can just search for earnings calendar, right? And then they, they, they separate at the top for you, okay, like um uh, 3rd March, okay, it's, it's 3rd March over here in Singapore, right? So these are all the, the earnings that will be coming out, okay? 
the earning calls that will be coming out this the EPS all right um, so it'll be good to look at their price action all right that's for equities now for Forex okay um, one of the reliable sites that I go to is really investing.com okay under news okay under the news tab you can go to economic calendar all right, and then you can actually do your filters. You can look for this tab, the filters. Click on it. All right, normally I'll just clear all. Okay, I don't really look at all the countries. I only look at this thing called the G8. All right, the G8, which means the group of eight. Those are the eight major currencies. So it's Australia, right? Um, Canada. Now, sometimes I look at China because China and Australia are very big trading partners. So they are quite close. Chinese news can very well affect the Aussie dollar as well. All right. Of course, I look at the eurozone. Okay, and then I look at the uh, Japan. All right, because we have Japanese yen. All right. Of course, we have the Kiwi, the New Zealand dollar. And then we have um, United Kingdom, the UK, the pound, United States. Right, so I think I'm missing one more, which is uh, Switzerland, right? The Swiss franc. Okay, so total we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, with China being the ninth exception. Like I said China and Australia are very closely intertwined. All right, so once all these uh, countries are selected <clears throat> for the category, I will select all category and I'll just look for the three stars. All right, so those are the very important ones. Okay, so and then I'll just go to this week, and this week all, you have all the three star uh, economy news coming out. Okay, so of course today, uh, sorry, on Sunday we had the uh, Chinese manufacturing PMI, which didn't really do very well. And then uh, Monday we had the pound manufacturing PMI, which did very well. And of course you see the pound going higher. So generally speaking, when it's it's better than expected, all okay, right, um, prices go higher. Okay. So in about 10 minutes time, we have the European CPI, all right, and then later on, we have the GDP followed by uh, of Canada and then followed by the Aussie GDP as well. All right, so everything is nicely done on this uh, economic calendar over here. Okay, I'm pretty sure, okay, FP markets will also have their own economic calendar, right? So you can have resources. Okay, and under resources, all right, uh, there is the economic calendar over here. Okay, you can actually go to this economic calendar. All right, and they actually have all the gray for low impact, yellow for medium impact, red for high impact. So you see um, the Canadian going to have their GDP. All right, when is this? Okay, on Tuesday, later on, right? Um, this ties in with our our economic uh, investing.com, all right, for, for the Canadian GDP. Okay, so 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 this is really uh, one of the place where you can uh, refer to, to news regarding the economic calendar, all right, for FX. Okay, so I, to, to wrap all this up at the end of the day, uh, Fundamental analysis, all right, is really to determine intrinsic value, all right, of an underlying asset. Okay, it works particularly well for stocks and fixed income because they are really based on macroeconomic and microeconomic data. All right, and at the end of the day, um, it is a tedious thing to do. It is a tedious uh, discipline to undertake. Fundamental analysis, all right, uh, combined with technical analysis, it can be very helpful. Okay, and when it comes to FX, the way to carry out general fundamental analysis is to also refer to the economic calendar and look for high impact news. All right, so that's really the time that we have for today. I, I, I hope I've helped you guys, all right, uh, in, in, in understanding uh, fundamental analysis. All right, if you guys have any questions, now would be the time for the questions. Okay, for all upcoming um, FP Markets webinar, you can actually go to fpmarkets.com backslash trading hyphen webinars backslash and it should bring you to our webinar page. All right. And of course, if you want a recording of this webinar, 
you can actually go to, okay. you can actually email support at fpmarkets.com. All right. All right, John, so uh, you were asking how many people joined this uh, session. I'm just curious as to your reason behind asking, but we have about uh, 28. You're welcome, Tristan and uh, Shane. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me. I hope this was a good value add for all of you. All right, with that, uh, I shall end today's session and I'll catch you guys the next time. Right? For now, trade safe, stay, stay safe. I'll catch you guys again. Take care.